And so talking about this and telling me so I can ask in the dining hall, oh, how's that strategy going, means you're much more likely to put the effort in, this intentional effort, um, than just kind of let it slide. And so that's what we're going to do now. So anybody want to share some of all these habits? What are you going to do, Fraser? Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, totally. And questions, yeah, I should say. Um, is the reason why you're waiting until next week to talk about these things is because you're interrupting our happiness? Because that's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, two reasons. One is I, uh, um, I'm kind of interrupting your happiness. I'm setting your expectation. Um, second thing is I will see uh, in the final week, uh, endpoints matter a lot. And so if I end on those, they'll stick with you best. Um, the other reason, though, is that this stuff actually takes work, and you're going to need a couple weeks to do these intentional practices more than you are going to be to do the final thing. So, so there's lots. There's a whole method to my madness about this stuff. But um, the good news is, though, is this, in some ways these techniques that we've just talked about are really powerful because they don't take as much work of, for you guys to fully overcome your miswanting. You can like now the job that gives you a huge salary. You can like trying to get good grades. You can like all the accolades that you think are going to make you happy. This is a way to take the stuff that you think is going to make you happy and actually let it make you happy. Um, so in some ways it's more powerful than the things you've missed. But yeah, I'm, I'm stringing you guys along. It's good. It's more fun that way. All right, but who wants to commit? Yeah. Also another question. Oh, yeah. Why do you suggest um, deleting social media instead of, like, teaching us how to use it in a healthy way? Aren't there, like, also positive, like, you can express yourself, you can connect with people? Wouldn't you be losing that part, too? Yeah. So that's actually a really good question. And, and I thought about that more as I was putting together the savoring part. Because one of the good parts of social media is that it often is a tool for savoring, right? Like think about your Snapchat stories, right? Like oftentimes you're doing a story about something you really want to like be thinking about and savoring. Often we're taking Instagram pictures of like, you know, delicious food or stuff we want to like share with others. And it lets us do that thing that was like kind of number one in the savoring, right? Which is like, I'm going <laughs> to share this with somebody else. I'm going to let other people see it. So on the one hand, it could be used for good. I think there's two features of it, even when we're using it for savoring, that are bad. One is that thing that I mentioned when we were talking about whether pictures can enhance savoring, that I worry that sometimes you're using the social media not to like really be more mindful and see the experience through a new light. Sometimes you're like, oh gosh, I gotta take a picture of this, or like, oh gosh, I gotta like, and you're on your like Facebook, or you're on like doing the Snapchat thing and typing it and like fixing your type, and you're not fully experienced, you, you're like destroyed your mindfulness. So I think it does that more than we think. The second thing is that, for better or for worse, sometimes our act of savoring can be negatively affecting other people because of the social comparison. So for every time I like, you know, take an awesome picture of like my food and I have this awesome delicious meal, it's making the person who's like not eating a great meal feel kind of like bad about themselves. And so it's hard to have the good parts with the bad parts. But I think if you're committed to making social media good, and my guess is that most of you are not going to admit to me that you're going to delete your Snapchat, so fair enough, um, I think it's worth kind of finding ways to either make your feed a little bit more positive. As I said, you guys could all commit to like being more honest in your feeds to give a better, like to savor things that aren't as crazy or don't make people feel bad, right? Um, you can also try to curate it a little bit better. So you can not go into it kind of habitually, which is I think a lot of people use social media. It's like, I'm just bored, I'm in line, like let me go see what's happening. Or not have it be prompting you with information, which is worse. You can kind of be active about your choice to go to it. And I think if you do it that way, then you're much more likely to kind of be mindful enough to do those sorts of stop thinks, where you're like, if you're choosing it actively, then all of a sudden people's stuff aren't gonna make you feel as bad because you're like, okay, wait, this is like what? Snapchat does is that sometimes I feel this way and you'll notice it and that can kind of put the brakes on it. So I think there are ways to use it positively. I think the problem is like other people aren't always and it's funny how I think the evolution of social media has moved more and more towards like an extreme social comparison. Like you know back in the day it was just like post what's happening like you know what, and now it's like pictures and media and these Snapchat stories where you really curate this narrative about how awesome you are and stuff. So I worry that Three years from now, there's going to be even more socially comparative kinds of social media out there. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so there are positive ways you can do it, but those are going to be very active seeming. They're going to take your intentional effort to make them more positive. Other questions? Yeah. In the first lecture, uh, you talked about the misconceptions of happiness, and you mentioned that having a good job or like earning a lot of money was not. Uh, what makes us happy, but what if that good job and earning a lot of money, you do that 
because you want to afford all of this new experiences mm -hmm. and how is that related or yep. how, what do you think about it? Yeah, so, so what I would like you to take from this lecture is that those things that you thought were going to make you happy can make you happy if you're the kind of person that puts those intentional habits into place. So imagine you, again, let's not even take a good job, which I think some of you guys think in this fantasy world of someday I'll have a good job. Take this thing that high school you would think was like the fantasy thing right now. You are Yale students, and legit you could wake up every day and be like, holy cow, I'm at the school that like I really, really wanted to go to. Like simulate like 14-year-old you and be like, this is the bestest. And if you don't feel that way, really do this thing, like sit down and write, in two weeks, you're going to graduate. Like, think about your friends. Think about the things about your life that were cool here. Like, think about what's facing you on the other side and how you're going to spend your time and how that's different. Like, literally spend 15 minutes writing that. And I bet even if you're the kind of person who, like, you know, like snickered at my, like, this is the bestest because you didn't feel like this was the bestest anymore. Like, if you do that 15 minute exercise, there will be things about this place that you will be like, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> Um, that can turn it on. And so, so this is the idea is that you can enjoy a good job, you can enjoy a marriage, you can enjoy like being at Yale if you put these practices into place. If you don't, your reference points will get all out of whack. Those ones that are out there in the world, you don't have a good filter, they're going to come in and make you feel bad. Your hedonic adaptation, you know, some of you have been here for years, it's, you know, your liking of this place is going to be down at the floor, but you have the power to like pop that up. So those goals can be great goals. And I think what you said, having a big income so you can have good experiences and so on, that's also good. But remember the caveat that like up to 75 grand, even with intentional practices, you don't get much happier than that. So yes, have a good income, but it doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be super good. Appreciating kind of mediocre experiences is just as good as appreciating these crazy millionaire experiences. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, when you talked in the beginning of this lecture about like experiences, um, I just wondered, uh, I know in the studies that they did, they probably dif didn't differentiate between different kinds of experiences, but I imagine that there would be like very different like reactions to experiences from say like, you know, going to like the island that you had in the picture to like, you know, going to grandma's house. So mm -hmm. like, uh, I was just wondering if you could speak to like the differences between uh, different kinds of experiences and maybe you'll get to that next week yeah, of, yeah. Uh, yeah, and what we should be valuing. Yeah, so the, the amazing thing is that, again, because our mind is bad at absolutes, like when we're on like, you know, the crazy French Polynesia, like, you know, $10,000 vacation versus the like, you know, I don't know, you hop on the Metro North and go to New York with your friends, you know, for 30 bucks kind of vacation, like we're not comparing it against that. Like we don't have this obvious comparison point unless you insert it and that would be bad. Like when you're in New York with your friends, you're not constantly like, well, this would be much better if I was on a $10,000 vacation, right? You just don't, that's, minds just don't do that unless you give somebody that reference point. And what that means is that there's no, for, for most experiences where you're having positive affect, like it's just that it's above baseline. That it's a change from your normal daily life here and it doesn't have to be a big change. And so this is kind of the crazy thing about positive and negatives. And, and one of the things that comes from not recognizing absolutes is that what our mind notices is change. Like our mind notices is change from time one to time two. It doesn't often notice the duration of that change, like how long your experience is. And it also often doesn't notice as much as we think the like magnitude of that change. It's just like, oh, this is better than before. And so the key is like, you don't actually need it to be that much better for it to count for your mind. It's kind of like at like a ceiling effect when it's just better, like minds notice that. And so that means that like, yes, there's probably some difference between going to your grandmother's house and going on this other crazy vacation. But in practice, if you're savoring the things that are positive, if you're grateful about the things that you have, if you're kind of being mindful throughout it, sometimes you can make those experiences just as good. Or at the very least, since we're never kind of doing the absolute line by line comparison, your minds just won't notice. One of the worst things that you can do is always compare whatever you're doing against the like crazy $10,000 awesome vacation. You know, as we saw, that's a like savor, a savoring killer where it's like, oh, I, it's not as good as this other thing or it's not as good as I thought it would be. That's just bad. Um, but in general, all of them positive. So in these experiments, they often are positive experiences and they usually equate across with the material goods at a monetary level. So they'll say an experience that cost $100 or an experience that cost that much and they'll match it with the material thing. Um, but it's hard to match in like, not monetary cost, but like in awesomeness, because again, like 
We just don't have any absolute way to rate that, even though we think we might.